groups today. What is a group? It's two or more people uh, who interact with, a, with and influence another, one another in, in so doing consider themselves as a group. Okay, so they're, they're just uh, together. Uh, and, and like I said, we're all, uh, we've all been in groups. Uh, this is a group. The people in this classroom are groups. We all interact together, we all talk to each other. You guys write down what I say or you pretend that you're listening to what I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, so we're a group. Uh, and and uh, as Colty was saying, you know, as soon as you, uh, uh, as, as soon as you don't have any friends, you start shooting boys up. And literally, that's what happens. Or they just go and hide someplace. And then they shoot the Like the Unabomber. Like the Unabomber, exactly, the Unabomber. I'm shocked that you know about the Unabomber. Uh, the human brain is adapted to maintain cohesion in groups up to about 150 people. So if we look at, if we look pre-Columbian in, in, uh, at the indigenous people in the United States, uh, when you traveled around, if you were a, a nomadic group, uh, how, many, how many people were in your group? Somewhere in the 150 range. That's just about all you could maintain, as interesting as that is. Now, the nomadic tribes did some really interesting things. Um, when I was working up in Montana, <clears throat> one of the groups on the reservation were nomadic. The other group was relatively stationary, but the, the other group was nomadic. Uh, the uh, they were uh, uh, Grovan uh -huh. and uh, Assiniboine, or Nakoda. They were Nakoda, and the Nakoda were fairly nomadic. Uh, so these guys would wander around, and they had to control. They had to control the group. So the way that they did it was that they had a secret society of men that would wear masks, so that nobody knew who they were. Theoretically, they had magical capabilities, which was really kind of interesting. Uh, I came in contact with that a couple times. <laughs> You don't, want to, you don't want to get crossways with these guys, okay? <laughs> anyway, so they would, uh, they would uh, embarrass people. They would go in, to, if uh, some guy was messing around with somebody, somebody else's wife, uh, they would go into uh, their teepee and they would, uh, they would uh, start screaming and, and making noise. They were clowns. They were referred to as clowns. So they would go in and start making noise and tell the, the guy that he wasn't supposed to do that anymore. He was supposed to be loyal to his wife and not to keep messing around. And if he refused to do what they told him, they would go in again and they would take all of his stuff and throw them out of the, throw it out of the, uh, of, of the teepee. If he still didn't do what they told him to do, they would uh, kidnap him and take him out and take him someplace that he had never been before, and they would leave him. And if if he was really bad, they'd leave him in a. They would uh, make it so that he couldn't get back. In other words, they broke his legs, oh, or yeah, or left him in a cave someplace in the bottom of a you know of a bottomless pit, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so that's how they controlled. The, that's how they controlled their society. But they they wandered around in groups of about 150 people, really. And they, each one was a different clan. You guys have clans. Your clans are, for one reason, their clans are for, for another completely different reason that had to do with who you traveled with. So you traveled with people in your clan. And just like in your society, if, if you were going to, you married outside of your, the woman married outside of your clan. Well, the men did too, of course, because all the <coughs> women were looking for somebody. And then they would get to, they would come together like three times or four times a year. And at that point, they would find uh, a new spouse or, or find a spouse or whatever was going on. Anyway, so they wandered around in groups of 150. Uh, most groups contain less than four people. And of course, here we've got five of us. There's five of us here. So we are a group. We can be a group. Uh, groups normally last for an extended length of time. But as in the case of fans at an athletic event, it may only be for a few moments. So the reality is, of course, and so we are a group. We are literally a group. Uh, I know I've got your names, all your names right here on my board. Here I'll sign you all in since we're all here. Travis is here. Colty is here. There we go. I already got Francis over. I know everybody calls Francis Frankie, but 
Francis and I understand each other. He reminds me of my dad. This is spooky last night. I'm, I'm, I'm working on my computer and I can see my reflection. It was my dad. My dad was in my computer. <laughs> it was me. But I looked just like my dad. That was freaky. And I'm going, wait a minute. Maybe it's because I have my glasses on. I took my glasses off. Nope. He was still there as my dad. Uh, social psychologists feel that uh, groups exist because people need to feel a sense of belonging in many of the things that they do. And this is known as affiliation. So we all need affiliation. You have affiliation with your tribe, you have affiliation with your clans, uh, whatever the clans may happen to be. Uh, you have affiliation with the psychology program. You may feel close to the people that uh, you go to classes with. Uh, if, uh, if it wasn't for this program, you wouldn't, uh, Francis would never talk to anybody. We wouldn't talk to anybody in this room. Potentially, but since <coughs> since you are in this group now, you guys interact. You you intercommunicate. You talk about uh, which classes to take, which instructors are hard, which instructors are easy, uh, and uh, and all the rest of it. This is known as affiliation, of course. So you have affiliation. We need affiliation as humans. We need to feel like we're part of something. The reality is that the lone wolf, this concept of the lone wolf, the guy that's wandering around all by himself doesn't really exist as far as humans are concerned because we're too weak. I cannot survive unless I'm with other individuals. Uh, and why in the world would, uh, would a group of humans scare off a bear? Why would that happen? Well, a bear's not stupid. Well, it's not smart. Well, maybe it is smart. But a bear, um, a bear of course, if they see three or four more people together, they don't know if they can, can defeat all three or four of those people. So, of course, the, the more people are, uh, that are around, the less likely that the bear is going to attack. Uh, if we think of uh, mountain lion attacks, and there, there are mountain lion attacks every year, there are mountain lion attacks all over the United States. Uh, we had one up in Montana while I was uh, on the reservation. Uh, <laughs> he, he, that mountain lion picked on the wrong guy. He was a little bitty guy, a little bitty skinny guy, but uh, he was armed and... and uh, he pulled out his pistol and shot the, the, bear, the uh, mountain lion. Then they cut the mountain lion open and they found eight house cats <laughs> wandering around the village eating their cats. Which were well, the stray cats or something. I don't know. Anyway, that's why am I talking about mountain lions? I forget. <laughs> oh, oh, when you're by yourself, the mountain lions never attack five people, they never attack three people, they all only attack one person, usually is a small person. So he probably, or she probably ate those cats one at a time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. One of the oldest concepts of social, social psychology is that people perform better and faster when in the presence of other people, and this is known as social facilitation. So we have affiliation, we all need affiliation, but social facilitation makes us work harder. And that, that has to do with uh, being in, in groups as well. The concept of social facilitation not only includes athletic events, but also is, the, is present at all, uh, in all species and most activities, including sexual activities among breeding pairs of rats, as odd as that may seem. Uh, the, the rats, when it's time for them to breed, they don't wander off into the corner by themselves and have their way with one another. That's not the way it works. They can only do. They can only have sex in groups, which seems like or like an orgy, but it's not really an orgy because there's only two people, two uh, rats that are actually having sex. But they they have to. Uh, they, their sexual activity has to be in groups, and of course, as humans, we rarely do that. And when we do do that, it's like you know everybody writes it up in the newspaper or something. Oh, there was an orgy or something, or you know we talk about it as as if it's something amazing. Uh, people have sex alone all by them, well, not by themselves, but with another person a lot. I mean, this happens a lot, but if it happens to be somebody attended an orgy, you know, it gets written up in the internet <clears throat> or whatever. As odd as that is. Okay, so we're humans, and we, we like to have sex uh, with, with just uh, two people, but uh, rats, of course, they can't have sex unless they're doing it in a group. However, social facilitation does not always take place. Uh, in fact, with more complex activities, the presence of others actually tends to hinder your performance. And that's one of the reasons why you take tests 
and they don't want you to look at anybody else's paper, or they don't want you to share answers with other individuals. That would be social facilitation. Uh, they try to put a chair between you and everybody else, you know, and all the other people. Uh, so social facilitation, that's, that's to help you. Uh, some people like to make noise during a test, of course they don't do that very, for, for very long. But there are other individuals that have to concentrate. Uh, the reality is that there are people that, uh, that there are people that have the ability to ignore uh, outside uh, interference. Uh, they can con they have the ability to concentrate on something, uh, no matter what's going on around them. Uh, I had a friend that uh, he could read a book in the middle of a fraternity party. It was just the most amazing thing. I, did, I hated fraternity parties because they were always doing stupid things like getting drunk and, you know, uh, s surfing down the, the, the stairwell on, on mattresses. That's stupid stuff. You know, things that, that people get hurt doing. Uh, and I always thought that was stupid. But I had a friend, and so I went, to, he, he invited me to, actually it wasn't him, it was, uh, it was his uh, roommate that invited me to this fraternity party. So I went over there because they were my friends, and, and so I went up. Andy invited me, and so I, I, I was over there, and Andy said, oh, here, have a beer, of course, I don't drink. So I said, no thanks. He said, well, you're not going to have nearly as much fun if you don't drink. And I said, that's okay, <laughs> I'll pass. And here's John sitting there. He, he, had, a, he had his beer. You had a special mug, you know. You know how fraternities are. They they write your name on a mug, and then you have to drink out of that. It's a liter. It's a it's a, it's like three cans of beer. Going that thing. I know it's huge. Uh, anyway, so he's got his mug sitting sitting in front of him, and it's it's completely full. And he's there reading biology. He's reading about he's reading biology. How in the world can you concentrate on biology with all this noise? I mean, the music was loud. There were women, part only partially dressed. They had taken their shoes off. That's what I, mean. <laughs> I know. And here, here these women are running around barefooted, and, and John's not even noticed. I mean, he's, he's sitting there studying. How in the world can you do that? What kind of people can concentrate with all that, with all that noise going? On? Turns out, people with Asperger's syndrome. Autism. If they're autistic people, never pay attention to anybody anyway. But people that have Asperger's are able to concentrate. Like Sheldon. Like Sheldon. Exactly like Sheldon. Sheldon <laughs> has Asperger's. I swear the man has Asperger's syndrome. Uh, according to work by uh, Robert Zients, that's the way you pronounce Z-A-J-O-N-C. I think he's uh, Serbian, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the anxiety caused by the presence of others inhibits uh, complex tasks, but it facilitates simple tasks. That's why um, uh, uh, doing th simple things, what am I thinking of running? Running is, is relatively simple. All you do is move your legs. So you don't really have to concentrate. So the more people that are yelling and screaming that you need to run faster and, fa and faster and faster, the more it's going to help you run faster, faster, faster and faster and faster. That's one of the reasons why people run faster in a meet than they do in a, in a uh, in practice. So one thing has something to do with the other, and it has to do with social facilitation, of course. Uh, who just died? Oh, uh, Roger Bannister just died. The guy, the first man to break the, the four-minute mile just died. I have a tape of, of him running that, that uh, four-minute mile. It's three minutes and 56 seconds. <laughs> 58 seconds long. <laughs> it's really interesting. Uh, athletes tend to be more energized when they are given support. Uh, for this reason, home field advantage is very important since the athletes are more likely to be supported in their own territory, and that's one of the reasons why they do this, or that's why you have home, home games. This is no more true in, in any sport than soccer, where almost 70% of the games are won by the home team. And this is really important to, like everybody else in the world, except for people in the United States, because we don't really care that much about soccer. But uh, the EPL, the English Premier League, uh, the Bundesliga in, uh, in uh, Germany, the, uh, there's a Spanish League, there's a, uh, there's a Belgian League, there's a Dutch League, a 
Ajax seems to be the best team all, almost always. Anyway, so uh, lots of, uh, so this is really important as far as they're concerned. If we look at the EPL, the uh, English Premier League, and, and uh, see if, uh, uh, how many times uh, teams will win a, uh, an, an away game, it's very relatively rare. And usually the team that wins uh, the EPL is the team that can actually beat other teams on their own field, on, their, on the other team's field. That's the team that wins. Everybody wins their home game. Oh, not everybody, of course. But anyway, seventy percent of, of the games, and this is uh, st this is these statistics uh, looked at all the European leagues, and what they discovered was no matter who who the team is, uh, they uh, uh, have a difficult time uh, winning away games, um, and they always make their away jerseys uh, very interesting, very flashy. Why? Because their home home jerseys are really boring. <laughs> uh, I know, it's silly. Uh, while individuals tend to gain comfort from being around other people, too many people tend to have the opposite effect. Uh, when people are crammed in shoulder to shoulder, they tend to have the same reactions. Um, uh, that close together, people tend to have higher pulse rates and higher blood pressure. So, if we were, if you had, if this classroom were looked like this, and you had to sit shoulder to shoulder with somebody else. Uh, you, it would be uncomfortable for you, or potentially it wouldn't be uncomfortable for you. What do you think? Would you be uncomfortable? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Travis, what do you think? Uncomfortable? Yeah. Should we move somebody right beside you and force you to move your stuff? She goes down. <laughs> and of course, that isn't always sits in the back. <laughs> We're going to move somebody back there with you. I said, what do you think? Okay. <laughs> now, the interesting thing is we're, we're not really talking about everybody in the world. There are some people that feel more comfortable when they are packed shoulder to shoulder, and that would be the Japanese and the Chinese. It's a very crowded country. Japan is extremely crowded, more crowded than you can potentially imagine. These people, they have what they call honeycomb uh, <coughs> hotels, uh, where it's it's one bed right on top of the other, but it's they're se separate compartments, but it's just large enough, you know. Well, it, it's about this big, so and you crawl in there just to go to sleep. So you've got a ladder that goes up to this thing, and you crawl into your bed, and you've got it's. You've got that much room. That's it. And that's all. It's not like you've got a bathroom all to yourself. It's a communal bathroom. Uh, you, I don't know. <laughs> there is internet. Uh, they do have internet, so that's kind of cool. But it's, uh, it, you know, and they could put 300 just on a wall. You know, 300 of these bed things. I know, it's a lot of fun. Really kind of cool. I know, <laughs> Japan. I told you the story about the Japanese stewardesses. No. You get Edison knows his story. Tell Edison. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to visit my wife. <laughs> my wife was stationed in Japan, or in uh, Korea. And uh, I was back in Oklahoma, and I, I got some time, I got a couple weeks off, uh, so I decided I would fly to Korea and, and be with my wife. I hadn't seen her in six months, which is a long time. Yeah. It's a long time. <laughs> So I was really ready to see my wife, as you can imagine. So I got I got on an airplane at uh, Will Rogers Airport in Oklahoma City and flew to Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, I got on a JAL flight, a Japanese Airlines flight, and we flew to Tokyo. But you don't fly across the ocean; you fly around the, the Pacific Rim. So we flew up through uh, up or, up over Canada, up over Alaska, and down into. Japan, that's the way you do it. Okay, so it's an 18 hour flight. Uh, it's an 18 hour flight. It was a jumbo jet. There must have been 20, 25 stewardesses on the thing. And, well, the Japanese are very polite people. Uh, before you eat, uh, they bring you a hot towel to wipe your face and clean your hands off. Then, after the meal, they bring you a warm washcloth to wipe your face and clean your hands off. Uh, so these, these ladies are just 
jogging back and forth. I mean, the whole flight, 18 hours, these ladies are just moving all over the place. They fed us twice. <coughs> I know. And, and if, you, if you rang your bell, they would be there almost instantaneously. So, I mean, these, these stewardesses were just sprinting all the, for 18 hours. It's just amazing. Skinny little, you know, Japanese ladies. Cute little things, you know, little doll people, lots of Japanese people, not very big, but kind of, kind of small. Anyway, so we got to the airport in Tokyo. Uh, oh, we got, to, we got to the airport in Tokyo. Uh, and since I was going on to, to uh, uh, Korea, I didn't have to go through customs. Uh, so I was able to get off the plane first. And uh, I got off the plane, and, and it was a monorail. They, they landed us on the, on the tarmac, and then they took us like two miles to the, uh, to the airport. Uh, so they landed us here, and they, they put us on a monorail and took us to the airport. So I get on the train, and I was the first one on the train. And so I you know, got in, up into the corner because, you know, there's, where, where else am I going to go? Uh, and the next people that got on the, on the plane was all the stewardesses. And so where did the stewardesses go? Well, the Japanese are used to being really close to each other. So when they saw me up in the front of the train, they all came over to the front of the train. <laughs> <laughs> and Japanese, well, it's, it gets crowded. And of course, you know, they just had enough room that this was a jumbo jet that had like 500 people on it. So, and, and it, there were like three cars for 500 people. So I'm not thinking, of course. I'm I'm in the corner, uh, and I've got and I'm surrounded by all these little doll people, these these cute little Japanese stewards. Of course, I hadn't seen my wife in six months. So <laughs> so pretty soon <laughs> we're packed in there like sardines, and I didn't even think about that. And here, I'm literally, I'm totally surrounded by Japanese stewardesses. I got them in my face. I've got them on my shoulders. I've got them behind me. I mean, they're everywhere. I got, you know, they're, you know, and they're Japanese, so they've got no, they've got no expression on their face. You know, they're standing right next to me. They're, you know, we're shoulder to shoulder, literally. I've got two stewardesses behind me. I've got one. I've got two stewardesses in front of me. I mean, I've got them. They're everywhere. So the train starts. It's a monorail. I don't know if you've ever been on a monorail, but rocks to side to side because it's on a single rail. So here we are. We're rocking side to side. I got all these these ladies rubbing up against me. <clears throat> Standing lap dance. <laughs> Can you imagine? No. Okay. I know. I couldn't either. <laughs> I had no idea. Oh, this isn't the time. I haven't seen my wife in six months. This is not a good idea. Okay, but there's, there's a, the rest of the story. It's kind of interesting. The rest of the story is that uh, nothing. Didn't react to this. Standing lap dance. I had four boobs in my back. I mean, it was terrible. <laughs> I'm getting all rubbed up against it. Uh, you know, I'm trying to be as small as I possibly can. <laughs> but I didn't have any reaction to the to the stewardesses, and it kind of scared me a little bit because I, I was getting up there in age. I was about 45 years old. There's a probability, you know, there's a lot of probability that something was wrong. There was a, all, always a possibility that there was something wrong. And these ladies had been sprinting. I mean, they were not really sweaty. Japanese don't sweat very well, but they uh, they were, you know. They had 18 hours of, of activity on their skin. So the question is, what's going to happen next? I mean, I was going to get on a plane the next day and go visit my, you know, go see my wife. What if, you know, here I'm, I'm thinking two, two weeks of, of honeymoon. That's what I was thinking. And of course, <laughs> all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh my God, maybe nothing's going to happen. Maybe that honeymoon I was thinking of will be like a, I was depressed. I mean, it was really kind of sad. I was worried that night. I didn't sleep at all that night. I didn't sleep at all. So I, I got on the plane. Of course, this is a KL flight. We flew from Tokyo to Seoul. And got off the plane, and there was my wife, and no problems whatsoever. I know. 
So why in the world didn't I respond to the Japanese students? I mean, I had them all over, and they were they were cute. They were really cute. So why didn't I react to them? Because you wanted your wife. I'm sorry. Because you wanted your wife. Oh, isn't that romantic? <laughs> I was so in love with my wife that I wouldn't respond to another female. That's not even logical. Because you're not a rat. I'm not a rat? Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe that's true. Uh, I assumed that it had to do with pheromones. Japanese don't have any pheromones. And of course, I give off the, the sexual odors, of course. Any odor, any odor at all. So we attract Japanese don't, of course. They've, been in, they've had arranged marriages for thou a thousand years in Japan. And as Europeans, of course, we have never had arranged marriages. It just isn't something that we did. So we have pheromones to attract each other. And because I'm a European, and my wife's a European, and it's, pro it's possible that the reason that I was attracted to my wife is, was because of her, the pheromones she put on. And maybe she was attracted to me because I was so handsome. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> the reason she was attracted to me was because I was a really good softball player. <laughs> I played third base. I hit home runs every time I came up to that. Of course, that was a long time ago. That was when I was in the serve. She picked me, literally, she picked me off the softball field. Hmm. Well, she likes softball players, I guess. I like wrestlers. <laughs> <laughs> and I was wearing softball pants when I got off the plane. <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> anyway, so it, had, it probably had to do with fair. Uh, they don't put off pheromones, and, and since they weren't putting off pheromones, and I wasn't detecting any pheromones, I wasn't, there, there, I wasn't being cued to, uh, to be uh, sexually excited, despite the fact I was being kind of like having a massage. You know. Okay, anyway, it was an interesting massage. A standing lap dance is what it was. <laughs> no pheromones, okay. Why are we talking about crowds? Because the Japanese, because they pressed up against me. Here I was standing kind of in the corner. It wasn't really in the corner. There was, there was, uh, and <laughs> I'm thinking, well, nobody's going to get in front of me. Geez, I had like, you know, two rows of Japanese people in front of me. That's what I had. Because that's the way they do things. They, they crowd. Nicholas Cottrell uh, feels that the reason individuals perform differently when people are watching is because the individual is concerned about how others are evaluating them. Researchers have discovered that people perform better when their co-actor is slightly superior to them. Uh, and this is what happened to me when I was running track. Uh, I, had the, uh, I was running with the fastest man in the county. He was the fastest quarter miler in the county. And because of that competition, uh, I always ran my optimum, I always, always ran my best because I was running against the fastest uh, person in the county. And the, that was our junior year. And he always beat me, and I was always right behind him. Uh, but we were never, nobody else was in between us. Uh, nobody beat him. Nobody beat me. Uh, we were always one and two. And the next year, we were one and two again, but actually we had flip-flopped, and now I was the fastest guy. But it was because he was so good. If he hadn't been very good, I would have, wouldn't have run that fast. But because he was that good, we, we uh, pushed each other. We were able to push each other. And we both broke the school record, and we kept breaking it. Every, every track we, we would break the school record. Uh, arousal decreases uh, when a high-status group is diluted with people uh, the performer doesn't care about. Uh, so if you're around your friends, you're, you're probably, or your teammates, and this is one of the reasons why teammates, uh, why becoming a, a good team member is so important. Uh, every year we have, and, and we're going, we may see this in the Yankees. All of a sudden, the Yankees have... Uh, the, the home run king of the National League and the home run king of the American League are, are both on the same team. Giancarlo Stanton has just joined the Yankees. So it's going to be interesting to see how that team uh, melts. Uh, remember when the Heat had uh, Dwayne Wade and they had LeBron James and they had somebody else. They had somebody else that was really Chris Bosh. They had Chris Bosh. So here they had three of the best basketball players in the NBA, and they lost the championship. They not only lost the championship, but they, they uh, lost in the first round. 
This is the first year that they were together. The second year, we see exactly the same thing. They hadn't melded yet. They weren't a team yet. But as soon as they uh, started hanging out together, as soon as they became uh, friends with one another, they started competing better. And when they started competing better, of course, they won championship. And then they won the next year, and then they broke up the, the group. The Heat sold LeBron James to Cleveland. Well, anyway, the rest of it's history. People who worry about evaluations are the ones most affected by their presence. Uh, I just had my, my faculty evaluation. I wasn't really worried about it because I could retire anytime I want. <laughs> I'm, I'm 68 years old. I can start getting so I don't need this job. Yes, I do. I love I love my I love teaching. So I need this job. As soon as I start feeling old, I'll probably retire. As soon as I first start feeling old. Yesterday, well, you guys were, well, Travis was in class with me yesterday. I couldn't remember the word float. <laughs> I kept trying to remember the word float. <laughs> and, you know, these words, they escape you from time to time. I'm sure it doesn't happen to you guys, but it happens to me all the time. Uh, anyway, I couldn't think of the word float. Of course, Travis is in the corner laughing at me. <laughs> you think I didn't see you chuckling? <laughs> And finally, who, who uh, helped me? Oh, Moe's helped me. And Moe's, Moe's is the one that came up with the word float. Or at least I looked at her and I thought of the word float. I don't know what it works. Anyway, so if you're being evaluated, of course, it, it really bothers you a lot. I was just evaluated uh, by my boss uh, downstairs. And of course, I, like I said, I didn't care because I can retire anytime I want. And my wife is starting to pressure me to <clears throat> come back to, to Iowa. She ought to bribe me. You know, she bribed me. I'd, I'd, I'd be gone in that quick, but she won't do it. I don't know. If you come back, I'll get, I'll get you a new dog or something. I don't know. A new car. A new car. Well, I got a new car. Yeah. <laughs> How many cars do I need? Anyway. Social pressure is the most intense when people are unfamiliar and hard to keep an eye on. And, of course, that is, uh, that's the problem. Well, well, and that's one of the, the reasons that select neighborhoods, uh, they have more, more trouble. Uh, the reason is because uh, there, there isn't a police presence there, and therefore the people are doing what they want to do, whatever they want to do. And because of that, of course, uh, there is a lot more trouble. Researchers have found that when a performer is distracted, uh, they are more aroused when the distraction is human, or whether the, human is, uh, whether the distraction is human or not. So if you're distracted, you, you don't perform as well. Robert Zients, and this is one of the reasons why, if you, if you follow basketball at all, uh, the individual that, uh, that uh, talks to the other players, uh, they, they seem to uh, be better at uh, playing defense. This is, was one of Michael Jordan's strengths, was the fact that he BS'd so much and that he harassed people. Uh, he was really good at harassing people. Like Ronda Rousey. I'm sorry? Like Ronda Rousey. Yeah. Exactly. Love her. <laughs> exactly. What is she doing now? She's, she she's works with WWE now. Okay. So she's a wrestler instead of a... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. MMA fighter or whatever she, she put was. women in the UFC on the map. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. Well, she got... It's like, no one really cared about UFC and like women. In there, she made. She was the first woman in decades. Right. Into you. She's a wolfer. She's a talker. She's mm -hmm. a gabber. Yeah. But then that lady. And she just, held that title consistently for twelve times. Not yeah. only that, was she an Olympic medalist several times. Right. But she, I love that, her. that one lady dropped her twice, and that was it. Yeah. She was done. Holly Holm. Then she lost the belt right after she got it. Oh, was that right? Yeah. Oh, she, she doesn't have it anymore. And then Misha Tate lost the belt after she got after she <laughs> beat Holly Holm. So the belt's just everywhere. There's no consistency like Rousey had. Uh, Holly Holm. Holly Holm. Is that Holly Holm from yeah. Albuquerque. Is she from Albuquerque? Yeah, she's from Albuquerque. I thought she was from Iowa. No, she's from Albuquerque. Oh. Her family's from Albuquerque. Oh, okay. hmm. I had a student that was uh, her best friend, which is kind of interesting. Mm. I know. <clears throat> then she left our school to play basketball and then at another school. 
Robert Zients has shown that people react to the presence of another person, whether they are evaluating uh, or not. Joggers are energized when running with someone else, uh, no matter how good they are. And of course, this is uh, exactly what happened to me. I was when I was uh, when my wife was stationed in Japan. I was with her, of course, uh, but I didn't have a job, uh, so I was running twice a day. I ran in the morning and I ran in the afternoon. And I had this three-mile loop that I would run, and I timed myself every day, and I'm, I'm improving a second, and then I improve a second and a half. So I'm really happy because I'm getting faster and faster and faster. So uh, I, I ran at lunchtime this one time, and uh, so here I am, I'm headed out. At about a mile, I picked up this other guy, and he was right in front of me. Uh, so I decided, well, I can run with him. And uh, when he detected that I was there, he started running faster. Well, it was a three-mile loop, so we, when we hit the, the mile and a half, we saw each other because, you know, it was a loop, so he was on the same sidewalk I was. We were running on a sidewalk. So when he turned around, he would look right into my eyes, and I knew, oh, he's going to go faster. <laughs> so when I turned around, so I tried to stay with him. And I did a pretty good, and I did, I stayed with it. Uh, about it to the two mile mark, and about the two, a little bit farther than the two miles, I passed it. And uh, so I'm moving pretty good, and uh, he's right behind me, of course. Uh, and I, I was a sprinter in college, geez, I, so you're not going to sprint me, that's for sure. <laughs> anyway, so this guy comes up, and he's right on my shoulder, and I'm moving pretty good. Uh, and. Uh, we're, we're going okay, and uh, at about a uh, quarter mile to go, uh, he curved off and went to the gym, and I curved off and went to my house. So then I sprinted in, and you know, I, I hit the, the, my mark, and I stopped my stopwatch. And I looked at my stopwatch. I had improved my time by 25 seconds, just because I was running with that guy. I, I wasn't, I was even less tired than I normally was. Wow. I know. But it has to do with social facilitation. I was running with him. We were running together. I set a <coughs> mark that I would never, ever achieve again. <laughs> now, what did I run? Uh, so the next, next time that I raced, I ran at 2050, 2050 uh, 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 5K, 5 which is really fast for me because I'm, I'm a sprinter. I'm not a jogger. Not, a run, not that kind of a runner. <clears throat> researchers, researchers have discovered that when people are working in a group project, people tend to exert less effort toward a common goal than if people are being held accountable individually. And this is known as social loafing. Uh, so, and this is one of the problems. This is one of the reasons I hate to work in groups, because I want to get the job done. Uh, when I was in the service, uh, they, would send, they would send a squad out to... Uh, to uh, unload a, 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 a truck. And so who did all the work? Well, there were some people that were going, you know, we could, we could probably unload that truck a lot faster if we did this. And of course, they're sitting there and they're going, what do you think? You know, and so they're talking to this other guy. So while they're talking, trying to figure out how to unload the truck, we're unloading the truck. So by the time they decide how we should unload the truck, it's already damn, the whole damn thing's unloaded. I know. Now here's the deal. So, so who are the ones that are unloading the truck? It's usually the farm kids. It's usually the kids from the rural area. It's the city people that are trying to figure out an easier way to get things done. Lazy pieces of crap. Did I say lazy, lazy pieces of crap? I didn't mean that. Social loafing, that's what I meant. Social loafing, they're just social loafers. So when the sergeant comes and checks on everything, he says, oh, you guys did a really good job of stacking that up. Of course, we're farm kids, so we've been stacking hay bales all of our lives, and we know how to put things together so that they don't fall apart. And guess who takes credit for the whole thing? City. The two guys that have sat there and supervised with their butts. <laughs> John Sweeney refers to people uh, benefiting from social loafing as free riders, and of course these guys were free riders. The thing is that uh, eventually it's, it's all going to come back and bite them in their uh, advising portion of their body. <laughs> it's going to bite them in the butt because uh, they're not going to be able to get things done. Uh, 
Uh, if they're if they're not with somebody that wants to get the job done, then you know they then they have to do it themselves. Well, they're not used to doing it themselves. So if they had to stack it themselves, they would do it in per excuse me incorrectly, uh, and then that's usually what happened. So we weren't with them, <clears throat> doing all their work for them. They they couldn't do it themselves. Anyway, the free riders, individuals who benefit from the group, but give little effort in return, and of course. That's free riders. And that's one of the reasons I hate to do things in groups. That's why I don't put you guys in any groups and have you do a, a group project. I think it's not really right because who's going to do all the work? The work? Well, Colty is, of course, obviously. She's the one that's going to do all the work. The rest of you guys are obvious free riders. Just look. I'm just kidding. <laughs> one of the downfalls of communism was the prevalence of social loafing. Uh, with no impetus to uh, stick out and no incentive to, to improve production in communist countries stagnated, uh, how much should you do? And, and I've, I've actually been in this situation, now that I didn't work in a communist country, but I worked in a union shop. And in a union shop, you do just a select amount of work. And if you try to do more work, if you try to do piece work, uh, then the union will come and tell you to stop because you're working too hard. That means everybody's got to work that hard. Now they know that you can produce 100 pieces a, an hour, whereas the, uh, the union uh, uh, requirements are 75 pieces an hour, but I'm making 25 extra pieces, and they're going, you can't do that. You make the rest of us look bad, which means they're going to raise, they're going to raise the, the, uh, the, level, the number of pieces, so you have to stop. So what I would do, I would make all my pieces, and then I'd go and take a 15-minute break or 20 minute break, half an hour break. Sometimes I could crank things out in 15 minutes and I could take a 45 minute break. While in uh, private production of agriculture, the people, are out, people outstrip themselves uh, and their neighbors when they were allowed to grow their own food. This is in a communist country, of course. Uh, they started allowing uh, the uh, farmers in China and in uh, the Soviet Union uh, to, to produce their own uh, their, their own stuff, and they were allowed to, to sell that. Uh, people will uh, still watch public television, though they refuse to contribute money to public television. So they're free writers. They're not really paying for what they're getting. Uh, NPR is the same way, National Public Radio. People listen to NPR, despite the fact they would never donate money for NPR. Anyway. Sorry, you guys still need me to have that up. <clears throat> yeah, so we have social loafers all over the place, unfortunately. You pay your own way. On challenging tasks, when an individual perceives uh, their portion of the work as in indispensable, they work harder. Uh, they also work harder when they consider other individuals in their group as unreliable. So if you're working in a group and you know that somebody can't really do the job, you're going to do not only do your part, but you're also going to do their part to make sure that the job gets done. An individual will work harder when their, their performance will bring select rewards as with stock options. Uh, my dad was a banker and in their, at their bank they, they received stock options and they, they could purchase other stock options. Uh, so, geez, my dad, wow. He'd work, you know, 10, 12 hours a day. He would, uh, he'd work uh, 18 hours on a Friday, because that's paid. Friday's paid. So my poor dad, he just worked himself to the, to the bone. But when he was done, he had half a million dollars worth of stock. At one point, he had 1.2 million dollars worth of stock, and then the, uh, the, the, the Bush uh, uh, stock market crash hit, and, and his 1.2 million. Uh, because very quickly became about a, about a half a million dollars. Poor guy. See, I would have inherited a lot more money. I would have gotten a lot more money when my when my mother died. I said no. George Bush had to become president, and he had to have that stock crash, stock market crash. It's okay. I have a rich wife. Travis is laughing. She's a retired Air Force Colonel, okay? Yeah. Yeah. She makes more money. Her retirement pay is more money than I make here. I know. And I worked, I, I taught 34 hours last semester. 
I'm teaching 27 hours this semester. And she still makes more money than I do. Mm. It's not right. Or maybe it is right. Maybe I love it because, you know, I don't have to worry about the money. I, don't, I let her worry about the money. She's, a, she's an MBA. I'm a psychologist. I can't even add and subtract it until my wife takes care of all the money. But then again, maybe I give her my paycheck and I have no idea how much money I'm making and I never get, I, you know, I can use the ATM whenever she tells me again. <laughs> <laughs> well, this isn't right. I need to go, I need to call my wife. Let me call my wife. <laughs> <laughs> People tend to loaf uh, less when the other members of their group are considered friends rather than strangers. Uh, people in collectivist cultures, uh, social loaf less than people in individualistic cultures. Women who tend to be uh, less individualistic than men, social loaf less than men do. Men are the laziest people in the, in the world, literally. They are the laziest humans in the world. Women work a lot harder than men do. And that's why men will put off cleaning anything or cooking. You know, it's, if it's their turn to cook and you convince them to go ahead and cook, you know, you usually start dinner at 5.30 or 6 o'clock and they're going to wait until 7 o'clock and then something good comes on television, so you don't eat until 8.30 at night because they're social loafers. People are more likely to work hard when there are challenging, challenging objectives. They are rewarded for uh, group success. There is a spirit of commitment to the team. And of course, that's, if you're a faculty member, or you, or the, the whole reason that we're here, and of course you can tell if you've got a, uh, an instructor that's not, uh, doesn't care about his students. Uh, you know who he is, you know who they are, who she is, who they are, whoever they are. You know if uh, the students are the, are the top objective as far as they're concerned, by the way, that they treat you. And you know that, uh, you guys can perceive that uh, when you go into their classrooms. Uh, if they don't listen to what you have to say, they only listen to what they have to say. They may not be team players, anyway. <laughs> uh, but we need to be rewarded. I'm supposed to get like an $18,000 bonus. We'll, we'll see if that happens. You know, it seems like a lot of money, doesn't it? The last, the last time, you understand what happened last summer, my, uh, we had to, to uh, uh, go to court down in Florida to get, my, to get my, my grandson and my daughter out of Florida. Jeez, what a mess. It costs money to leave the damn state. Does that make any sense? Well, sure it does because he had a lot of money and he was trying to keep them in the state. You know, so we had to go to court. Mm -hmm. Ah, ah, Zimbardo, Zimbardo. <laughs> Zimbardo's group uh, built a mock prison in the basement of the psycholo psychology department at Stanford University and paid students to play the role of guard or prisoner. Uh, this was back in the, in the early 70s. Uh, the roles of the, the students played was determined by a flip of the coin, so they either became a prisoner or they became a prison guard. Uh, the, uh, the interesting thing is, how much do I have about this? Uh, the interesting thing was they, they actually arrested these kids on, on campus. So they had uh, the campus security was driving around. They put them in handcuffs, threw them in the back of, the, uh, of their uh, police car. Uh, they took them to the psychology building and they, they uh, took them downstairs. They dressed them in certain clothes. Do I have the clothes? I do Yeah, there they are. Okay, I've got the whole thing here. Okay. Yeah, really kind of fascinating. As you can see, they, they put them in nightgowns. Uh, they did all kinds of interesting things to these people. It was really kind of fascinating because these, uh, Stanford's one of the best schools in the country. So these are fairly elite individuals that they are arrested, that are acting like prisoners. So you wouldn't expect them to get into the mindset of a prisoner because these are rich white kids. So why in the world would they even have a clue what prisoners act like? Why would they even have a clue what uh, a guard looks like? 
The guards were outfitted fitted with a uniform of khaki shirts and pants and a whistle, a police nightstick and reflecting sunglasses. The prisoners were outfitted with a loose-fitting smock with an identification number stamped on it, rubber sandals, a cap made uh, from a nylon stocking, and a locked chain attached to one ankle. Uh, so why in the world would they give them sunglasses? Well, they're indoors. Why would they give them sunglasses? They don't make eye contact. So they can't exactly. Exactly. It's like a mask. I'm the mask man. I can do whatever the hell I want to do. Uh, the experiment started with the prisoners being rounded up by, uh, by arresting them on campus, handcuffing them, and bringing them uh, to the makeshift jail. Uh, the experiment was supposed to last for two weeks. Uh, the study w uh, was to see if they could get these elite college students to start acting like prisoners and guards. Uh, the experiment was way too successful as the students quickly adopted their roles. The experiment had to be ended in only six days. Students started to break down. Not the guards, of course. The guards were in charge. The guards didn't have a problem. It was some of the, uh, some of the kids that were acting as prisoners. Uh, they started uh, planning jailbreaks. Uh, they started uh, acting like stool pigeons. Uh, they were emotionally broken by, this, by the whole episode. Zimbardo was the uh, prison was the warden of the prison, so he could have stopped at any time he wanted, and he didn't recognize any of this stuff. This guy's a psychologist. He's a PhD. He's the one that put the experiment together. He's the one that wrote the parameters for the experiment, but it started going out of out of whack after 24 hours, and he didn't see any of it. The only reason they stopped it was because he was having an affair with a graduate, female graduate student, who came in and looked at his experiment and said, oh my God, <coughs> this isn't right. You said that if this happened, then you were going to stop it, but that started happening the first day. And he said, well, I just thought it was normal. He missed the whole thing. It was the lady that was his squeeze is the one that came in and stopped the whole experiment, which is fascinating to me that he was dating a graduate student. <laughs> oh, Zimbardo. He still writes. He's still alive. He's still at Stanford, actually. And he, uh, he, he writes uh, textbooks. So you can uh, get a social psychology textbook from Zimbardo if you want. I don't because he's from California. The guards were very creative in abuse, verbally harassing and humiliating the prisoners. Torture was not unknown, and the warden, who was Zimbardo himself, watched and, and tacitly approved everything that happened. Nudity was used to humiliate people. Uh, they even changed guards, and those guards immediately slipped into the same roles. So they were worried that these guards were getting too abusive, so they changed them, and the other guards slipped right in. The prisoners almost immediately took on the role of someone without hope. They became passive, helpless, and withdrawn. Uh, some prisoners became so anxious and depressed that they had to be released early to save their sanity. And these, of course, are college students, and they've been there less than six days. Other prisoners planned escapes and retaliations against the guards. Uh, okay, in 2004, American military guards routinely abused prisoners in Abu Ghraib, a prison in Iraq. Uh, physical beatings, sexual abuse, and psychological humiliation were being used against these select individuals. The American public was shocked by pictures of these abuses. abuses uh, a few bad apples happened to end up in the unit guarding the prisoners. Is that what happened? Uh, and of course, according to, and Zimbardo thought about all this stuff. He, he understood that he missed the whole thing, that he missed the whole point of his, his own research. He said it's, it's, not, it's not the bad apples that are in the barrel, it's the barrel itself that is the problem. It's prison that's the problem. It, 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 this, it is institutionalized in this way. The prison, all prison guards act the same way. All prisoners act the same way. And when we did the same thing in Iraq, we got exactly the same results that we got at the uh, uh, Stanford prison uh, experiment by Zimbardo. And of course, all of those uh, guards that were torturing the Iraqis and doing horrible, horrible things to them were all arrested and thrown in jail because they were doing something they weren't supposed to do. But all prison sy systems are the same. 
unfortunately. And here are some pictures from Abu Ghraib. Uh, of course, these are, these are Muslims, right? And they're Iraqis, and they were very important Iraqis. Um, and they stripped them down naked. Uh, this is a female, a female, well, there she is back here. This is her back here. She's uh, pulling this guy ar around like a dog on a leash. Not only that, he's naked. And of course, that's not kosher as far as they're not kosher for the word, isn't it? <laughs> that's not right. As far as uh, Muslims are concerned, they're not supposed to be seen by a woman that is not their, their wife. Uh, and here she is, she's standing there. Uh, holding the men around like dogs. And of course, here's, here's actually a dog attacking a man. He's worried that he's going to lose his, uh, his uh, male reproductive organs to the dog's teeth and other things. They covered them in manure, human feces. They ma made them uh, act like they were uh, having uh, gay sex with one another. That's what this big pile of men is all about. This is, another, this is a female standing behind all those men, and of course, there's a man hiding his penis between his legs. Uh, they made him walk up and down. As horrible as that sounds. Not my fault. I wasn't at Abu Ghraib. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, but the point is that, uh, so who are the good guys? Were we the good guys in, in Iraq, or were we the bad guys in Iraq? There we were, look, we were taking their culture, and we were dumping it in the toilet and flushing the toilet. It goes completely against their culture. But as Americans, we were doing these kinds of things. So were we the good guys or were we the bad guys? Okay, group cohesiveness. Uh, group cohesiveness uh, are the qualities of a group that bind uh, members together and promote liking between the members. Of course, uh, the prison guards, of course, were a group, and they had group cohesiveness. That's why they were able to take the pictures that they took. Uh, this was going on for a number of months before they finally stopped it. The more cohesive a group is, the more its members are likely to stay in the group, uh, to take part in group activities, and to try to recruit new like-minded members. And, of course, that's one of the reasons why the NRA is such a strong organization. Uh, they've been controlling politics. I've said this before, but they've been trying to. They've been controlling politics for for three decades, for 30 years. So now we don't have anybody in Congress that isn't at least uh, paying lip service to the uh, NRA. Most of them are taking money from the NRA. Donald Trump took 30 million dollars for his uh, for his uh, campaign for president from the NRA. Uh, but of course that's not the only group. This is a group of uh, white supremacists waving the rebel battle flag. It's actually the, the flag of uh, Northern Virginia. <clears throat> uh, and uh, they, are, are, they are creating a group cohesiveness. Uh, if task uh, requires uh, close cooperation, cohesiveness uh, helps performance. Cohesiveness can interfere with optimal performance. An example is Kennedy and his administration dealing with the Bay of Pigs incident. Uh, well, the, uh, oh, golly, it's either raining or snowing. I don't know what that is. Whoa. Oh, great, I get to drive on this. Hot dog. I'm looking for it. Hot dog. <laughs> I like to drive it. <laughs> in really bad conditions. It's hot. <laughs> Uh, so what happened with the Bay of Pigs? Uh, the um, uh, Cuba was overthrown by Cuba was being controlled by uh, criminals, uh, by really bad guys. Uh, they supported um, that's snow. Uh, they supported um, and it's blowing all over the place. It's not that cold outside. It's a sun. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> So the, Cuba was uh, being controlled by um, uh, some individuals that weren't very nice people. Um, they were being backed by the United States uh, because we could control them. Uh, they were also being or, uh, controlled by organized crime. Uh, so there were a lot of casinos down there. There was a lot of prostitution down there. 
uh, down in Cuba. So if you were for a good time, you went down to Cuba because you could do whatever ever you wanted to do in Cuba. Uh, so then, uh, but there were a lot of people down there, and a lot of the people weren't part of the criminal organization. So they decided that they would overthrow the government, and the way that they were able to bring themselves together uh, was through uh, communist ideals, and that was where F Fidel Castro came from. Fidel Castro wanted to overthrow the government. Well, the United States wasn't that wasn't really against the overthrow of the Batista government down in Cuba because it was fairly corrupt. Uh, so Fidel, in 1959, Fidel Castro, who just died last year, uh, overthrew the uh, Cuban government. Uh, and of course, the United States, at the time, we weren't exactly sure who he was. Uh, and because, uh, um, uh, be, well, part of the reason was we we weren't listening to what he was saying. Uh, so we didn't realize he was a communist. Uh, so he overthrows the government all of a sudden, and, and all of a sudden he says, well, I'm a communist, and I'm in favor of, of uh, all the communist ideals. And of course, the people in the United States are really upset with the fact that we have Cuba, which is only 90, 90 miles away from Key West, uh, that we have Cuba right on our doorstep, and here they are, they've just turned communist. Uh, so we were kind of upset. The other thing that happened was all the wealthy people in Cuba, all the people that were part of the criminal organization, it was, it was a, a questionable government, okay? It was a, a very right-wing government, uh, it was overthrown, uh, those people had to leave. And of course they voluntarily left because they didn't want to live in a communist government. Because communists will uh, confiscated all of their money, they confiscated all their land. Uh, so all of these people left, and where did they end up? They ended up in Miami, 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 Florida. And if you go to Miami today, uh, if you go to the ballpark, the, uh, their new ballpark down there, it's right in the middle of the Cuban uh, neighborhoods uh, of, uh, of Florida. Really kind of interesting, because they speak a different Spanish than, well, here you guys, of course, speak. If you, if you speak Spanish at all, you speak uh, Spanish that's similar to what they speak down in Mexico. So it's kind of Tex-Mex is, is in essence what it is. But uh, uh, the Cubans speak a Castilian Spanish. Even with, Most of them even speak with a lift, which is just fascinating because they don't speak the same Spanish that they speak here. And a lot of the words are different. You know, A lot of things are different. So if you go down to Miami, where all of these Cuban immigrants went, uh, they, they speak a, a different Spanish than the, the Mexican Spanish that you guys speak. Okay, so uh, they so they've overthrown the government in 1959. Uh, uh, Fidel Castro was down there for a couple of years, and then uh, Kennedy was elected president. Uh, right at the beginning of his administration, uh, a group of of, of uh, Cuban immigrants from Mi Miami came to him and said, "We've got an army." We're putting together an army to overthrow Fidel Fa Castro, and all you need to do is back us. And so he did. He decided to help them. He, he armed them to some extent, uh, but he gave them support uh, through the CIA. So they landed at a place called the Bay of Pigs. <clears throat> and uh, the idea was, of course, and we always have this idea, we, we are, our ideas are better than anybody else's ideas. So what will happen when we land, when a liberating army lands in Cuba, is that the people will rise up and they will, all, they will throw out Fidel Castro and they'll throw out communism and they will embrace democracy. That's, that was the idea. Well, that's not what happened at all. And they landed at Bay of Pigs and they couldn't move because there was no uprising. Uh, the people were against, they, they tried to sneak off the, out of the bay and they were blocked by the peasants, by the people that were supposed to be rising up uh, and overthrowing this communist regime, and it didn't happen. It didn't happen at all. And so these guys, of course, these are wealthy people. They're, they're you know, they're like those, those guys that are sitting there and, and discussing how we're going to unload the truck and all the time the farm kids are all unloading the truck. Well, so these are, that's what was going on. So the Bay of Pigs people, a lot of them were killed, but uh, the ones that weren't were captured because, well, they were not really soldiers. They, were, they, they weren't really soldiers. 
Anyway, so that's what happened with the Bay of Pigs. Um, uh, Ken uh, Kennedy pulled the CIA's support. Uh, he was using uh, uh, air support, CIA air support. They were bombing and strafing the, uh, uh, the Cubans. Um, and of course, they captured all these guys, and then eventually they sent them all back to the United States. Uh, okay. Because of the incident happened at the beginning of the Kennedy's administration, uh, and the people around Kennedy were tightly knit group, no one argued against Kennedy's decision to allow the Bay of Pigs to go ahead uh, and occur. And because of that, of course, he got very bad counsel. Nobody was telling him no. That's kind of what's happening with Trump right now. Nobody tells him no. And every time somebody does tell him no, they get fired. If anybody goes against what he says, he just gets rid of them. And that's what just happened with Rex Tillerson. So that's the same thing was going on with the Bay of Pigs. Uh, Kennedy said, yeah, it sounds like a good idea to me. All these people are just like me. If you remember, Kennedy was a very wealthy person from Massachusetts. And he was kind of an elite. Uh, had gone to uh, private schools all of his life. Uh, so he, he recognized these individuals as being just like him. And he, didn't, and he thought, well, they're superior people, then uh, obviously they will, they will be followed by the, uh, by the farmers and peasants of Cuba, and that's not what happened at all. As a matter of fact, that, those were the people they were trying to get rid of, and they did get rid of them. Group members tend to be alike in age, sex, beliefs, race, ethnicity, and opinions. Uh, why are they similar? Uh, they are attracted to and likely recruit similar others. So if, uh, if, you're, if you're putting together an, uh, a, uh, an organization, uh, potentially you will look to other clan members, uh, uh, members of your clan, of this clan or that clan, uh, to be part of your group. Uh, I was, uh, they're putting together a, uh, we, we're having problems keeping faculty here. New faculty get here and they go, oh my God, there's no place to shop. I can't buy any lettuce because the lettuce at Bosch's isn't any good. And there's closest stores, the gas station, and all you can buy is really greasy food. You know, so they're leaving, okay? They're not staying. So we decided to put together a welcoming committee. Well, they started to put the welcoming committee to, together last night, and, and it turns out that it's all people from one department. That's all that's the only people in this in this welcoming committee. They're going to have to have people from other departments. <laughs> but the whole idea is, you know, we're, we're, all, in, uh, we're all very similar. We all, all have different, uh, similar ideas. So those are the people that we will recruit. Well, that's what happens with groups as well. The groups operate in ways that encourage similarity in their members. You want everybody to be like you. Uh, are there any members of the NRA that don't have guns? Is that a requirement that you have to have a weapon? So why does it turn out that they all have weapons? This doesn't make any sense. Homogenous groups are, are more cohesive, of course, because they look alike, they act alike, and they are alike. Uh, diverse groups perform better, however, because they have different, uh, differing ideas. Uh, if you have a homogenous group, you tend to get the same ideas over and over and over and over again. But a diverse group with, with different ideas, of course, uh, and this is one of the reasons why uh, at this institution, it's people coming in that actually change our, your programs. The people that are here don't change things. They keep things the same. But it's when uh, new people come from the outside. That's when things change at the institution. To examine the relationship uh, between a business's performance and its racial and, and gender diversity, Herring in 2009 conducted a correlational study of over 1,000 U.S. workplaces and found a positive association between both types of diversity with sales revenue and number of customers. So the more diverse your organization, the more likely that you're going to have uh, high sales revenue and, uh, di and, and customers uh, that are different. Uh, otherwise, you just get the same customers over and over again. You get all the white people. You get all the, uh, the tall people. You get all the rich people, and you don't get any of the poor people, or you don't get any of the middle class. You just get one type of customer. But the more diverse, the the uh, the uh, administration is, the the uh, the managing group is. The more diverse they are, the more likely that they will pull in people. They will have ideas that will pull in people that are, are more diverse. 
Does all that make sense? Okay, so when we have, uh, okay, what did they have? Uh, we, could, we see this in baseball. Um, if you have an old family that's been running a team for an extended length of time, what does the team look like? It looks like it's always looked. Uh, this happened in Boston. Boston was the last team in the major leagues to uh, integrate. Why? Well, they had, they had never had any African-American players on their team. They didn't integrate until 1958. Baseball uh, integrated in 1951. By, 19, by 1958, a lot of the teams were half African-American. But not Boston. They were lily white. Why? Because that's the way they'd always done things. Those, those are the people that they, uh, that they brought into the team, that they hired for the team. And then, you know, they, they couldn't win. They weren't winning. They were coming in last. And uh, so finally they started, uh, started uh, integrating their, their players. Uh, okay. These results seem to indicate a positive relationship between diversity and a business's bottom line. But as you know, because these data are only <coughs> correlational, we cannot draw conclusions here to, uh, regarding one variable uh, causing another. So we're not exactly sure if this is the reason why. Maybe it's differing ideas. Maybe well, who knows what it is. But for some reason, uh, uh, organizations with a diverse uh, uh, command structure are more likely to uh, have uh, a, a diverse clientele. And we know that that's true. We can't even see. Large groups can also lead to some pretty horrendous uh, behavior among people. During World War II, Japanese troops systematically ra raped and murdered 400,000 Chinese civilians in Nanking over a two-week period after the surrender of the city. Uh, they claim that it didn't happen. Uh, but it, it did. It happened because we have the pictures. Uh, they were playing games like, who can behead the man the best? Who can, who can chop off somebody's head the best? It was pretty god-awful. Uh, they were doing things. They didn't want to expend all the ammunition. They didn't want to shoot people, so they were killing them in other ways. They were bay bayoneting them to death. They were, they were using samurai swords and chopping their heads off. Uh, they were raping women, and of course they couldn't allow them to live because then they could testify against them. So they were raping and murdering all these individuals. Uh, they were just killing children in the streets, uh, willy-nilly. Of course, those are pictures of what happened to Nan King. So I'm not going to show you anymore. You know, we shouldn't be looking at dead bodies. These, all these people are alive, of course, but they're all starving to death because that's they're Jewish and they were in in Europe uh, during World War II. During the gen German genocide of the European Jewish population, the systematic murder of the population progressed from shooting and burying to gassing and burning because it was just too expensive to do it any other way. As god-awful as that sounds. And I'm not going to show you the next picture because it's got dead bodies. In it. Okay, there we go. Okay, we need to stop right here anyway. Uh, so on that Pleasant note, let's go on break. Maybe by the time you come back, you will have forgotten all of these horrible, horrible things. But the reality is people can do some, some really, really horrible things to, to other individuals. Mm -hmm.